Hi, this is Andy Turnbull, and in this session I'll be talking about the use of piggyback lenses after cataract and lens replacement surgery. So here's an overview of what we'll cover. Firstly, a definition. Then we'll look at the indications and alternatives, the advantages and disadvantages compared with other options, what specific IOL models can be used, and finally how to calculate the required power of a piggyback lens. So what exactly is a piggyback lens? So in this context, it's a secondary intraocular lens, usually implanted in the sulcus, in the presence of an in-the-bag primary intraocular lens. And you can see an example of a piggyback lens in situ in this image to the right here. And piggyback lenses have various uses. So firstly, and most obviously, they can be used to treat a refractive surprise after cataract surgery, or to correct residual astigmatism. Less commonly, they can be used as part of a planned primary procedure in cases where an, where an eye requires a higher powered IOL than is available, so it's so-called primary polysudophagia. And finally, a more recent use is in presbyopia correction, where a multifocal piggyback lens can be implanted either after cataract surgery or as part of the primary procedure on top of a normal monofocal lens to provide reversibility. As always, there are alternatives. Laser vision correction, IOL exchange, glasses and contact lenses are all options for residual refractive error, as well as toric IOL rotation to treat residual astigmatism if applicable. In cases of extreme hyperopia, it's usually possible to special order a higher powered lens, and, uh, and this would often be preferable in eyes that are likely to have more crowded anterior segments rather than putting two lenses in the eye. And for secondary presbyopia correction, laser monovision or contact lenses or glasses are the alternatives to consider. And piggyback lenses do have some significant advantages over other options. They're easier, they're safer and more accurate than performing an IOL exchange, and they're also reversible. They're pretty cheap and accessible to most patients, and similarly they're accessible to most cataract surgeons. If you can do a FACO, you can do a piggyback lens, whereas not all cataract surgeons have access to laser or would be comfortable performing a lens exchange. But there are also a fair few drawbacks. So it's an intraocular operation, so automatically higher risk than laser vision correction. And as well as the risk of endophthalmitis, there's also the potential for iris chafage and pigment dispersion, transillumination defects and glare, chronic uveitis, secondary glaucoma, lens instability, and also a pacification between the primary and the secondary lens, a condition called interlenticular opacification, or ILO. Now, ILO was originally described with two in-the-bag acrylic lenses, so really sitting right next to each other, uh, squeezed in the bag, but it's actually less of a concern with one lens in the bag and one in the sulcus due to the presence of an interlenticular space. Um, so we should really be cautious implanting piggyback lenses in patients with pre-existing endothelial disease, glaucoma, or a history of uveitis, as well as high myopes, as sulcus lenses are likely to be more unstable in large eyes. So piggyback multifocals are an interesting concept. Uh, these enable patients who've already had cataract surgery and who maybe weren't aware of the option of multifocal lenses to top up to multifocality. At the same time, fine-tuning of the refractive error from the primary procedure can be performed. And they can also be implanted during the primary procedure on top of a normal monofocal lens instead of putting a multifocal lens in the bag. So this has the advantage of being easily reversible in case of patients having problematic glare or halos, uh, and may be particularly useful in those cases where you're not sure whether patients are going to tolerate those particular side effects afterwards. Um, obviously, it's far easier to remove a sulcus lens than it is to remove a socked in lens from the bag. And two currently available models are the Sulcaflex Trifocal from Rayner and the add on progressive lens from First Q. So let's just talk about what IOL models can be used as a piggyback lens. So essentially, it has to be compatible with sulcus placement. Three piece lenses are an option. Ideally, one with a large optic and a haptic diameter to increase stability. But there are also IOLs specifically de designed for the sulcus to avoid chafage and improve stability. 
And the, the bottom line is that you should never implant a standard one piece lens in the sulcus, as this is almost guaranteed to give you the problems I mentioned previously with pigment dispersion, uveitis, glaucoma, and so on. So let's look more closely at three piece lenses. If you have a choice, then a silicon lens is a good option. They're slightly more adherent to the capsule than acrylic, so they may be more stable. There's also less of a risk of ILO when the piggyback material is different to the in the bag material. Having said that, acrylic lenses are still fine to use and the risk of ILO is very low unless both lenses are in the bag, which is very unusual nowadays. All of these lenses listed have a 6mm optic and a 13mm total diameter, except for the AR40, which has a larger diameter of 13.5mm in the low powered meniscus range, and that's because these lenses are typically designed for larger myopic eyes, and the Softec range, which has a total diameter of 13.25mm. Uh, importantly, you can't get toric or multifocal three piece lenses, so this may be a consideration. Moving on to the Sulcus specific lenses, the Sulcaflex from Rayner has been around for quite a while now and is now available in a multifo multifocal option. It's a hydrophilic acrylic with a 6.5mm optic and a large 14mm haptic diameter and the haptics are specially designed to promote stability, create a decent interlenticular inter space and reduce pigment dispersion. The add-on from First Q has a slightly different design, as you can see here, but again has been engineered to optimise stability, reduce lens touch and pigment dispersion. So how do you work out what power of piggyback lens to implant? So firstly, an accurate, stable refraction is crucial. For most pseudophagic eyes, this is around four to six weeks post-op. But for keratoconic or post-RK eyes, you need to allow a bit more time. And in these cases, you could consider the rule of twos, which means two stable refractions taken on two consecutive visits over a period of two months. And once you've got your refraction, a simple rule of thumb is for a myopic error to use a one to one conversion ratio. So for a minus one refractive surprise, you'd implant a minus one piggyback lens. For hyperopic errors, you use a 1.5 to one ratio. So for a plus one surprise, you'd implant a plus 1.5 piggyback. However, there are some more sophisticated virgins formulae available, and I like to use the Barrett RX calculator, which also gives recommendations for IOL exchange or toric rotation when applicable. The manufacturers of the Sulcus specific lenses, for example, Rayner, also have their own calculators, which are very good. So this is the Barrett RX calculator available on the APA CRS website. And this is a hypothetical case where a 20 diopter T2 was implanted and the post-op refraction was plus two with half a diopter of sill at 90. So we input the pre-op and the post-op Ks, which are the same in this case to keep things simple, and obviously all the other required biometric parameters. And this is the output recommending a 2.5 diopter piggyback lens for a target of emetropia. You can also see here that it shows you what would happen if you rotated the primary in the bag toric lens and essentially the calculator tells you that it's already in the optimum position and so there's no value in trying to rotate it. And here is how you'd calculate a piggyback lens if you were planning primary polypseudophagia in an extreme hyperope. So firstly accurate biometry is paramount, uh, even more so in these cases, and patients should be advised on the high risk of postoperative refractive error even despite the best efforts. As, as we all know, accuracy in hypropic eyes with high powered lenses is much less than average. So you then calculate the total in the bag IOL power required, which with, with, um, with whichever formula you prefer for these kind of eyes. And in this case, the required in the bag lens is a 45 diopter. You then choose the highest available power of your standard in the bag lens, which might be 34 diopters. So this means you've then got a deficit of 11 diopters, which has to be provided by the piggyback lens. You need to subtract some power due to the more anterior sulcus placement, which in this case is a reduction of half a diopter, meaning that a 10.5 diopter piggyback lens is the one that's required. So the power adjustment for sulcus placement varies according to the IOL power, and this table is lifted from Warren Hill's website, 
And basically it shows you that the if, if you're implanting a higher powered lens in the, in the sulcus, you need to adjust it by quite a bit. So uh, subtracting one and a half diopters from the in the bag power. Whereas if you're implanting a very low powered lens, then there's no change that's needed because the difference in effective lens position has a relatively low impact uh, depend, um, with lower powered IOLs. So just to summarize, piggyback lenses are a cheap, simple and accurate method of tackling spherical or astigmatic refractive surprises. They also offer reverse mul reversible multifocality, which is an appealing strategy. But the IOL that you choose must be suitable for the sulcus and there are risks and concerns about long term stability and safety. The IOL calculations themselves are pretty straightforward, but they're important and, it, and they should be performed carefully to avoid any silly errors. Thank you very much for your attention.